Hello, this is the lecture for Tuesday, 23rd of March, 2021, for Ancient History. Also, unlike normal, period six, hello, period six, is going to be watching this video in class because I can't be here then. So, uh, as obnoxious as it is, I'm going to expect you to watch me lecture on the screen. <laughs> Most teachers consider that to be ridiculously evil. In any event, um... Today I'm going to tell you about the fall of the Roman Empire, and we're going to talk about the various factors. Uh, as Mr. Kermsmeyer said, isn't it about time? Or something like that. Trust me, at some point in the future, a student's going to say, isn't it about time for the fall of the American Republic? And, eh, well, it's not so fun to live through. Okay, so we're in the late empire. It is the early 400s A.D., Theodosius the Great is dead, and the empire is permanently divided into an eastern and a western half. These two halves don't always get along. In fact, they are often in conflict with one another. So, um, Rome is weak. Now let's flash to Asia. North of China's Great Wall is a roiling set of uh, Central Asian tribes, which are ultimately going to include the Manchus, the Mongols. But at this point, they are dominated by the Sung Nu, what we in the West call the Huns. If you've seen the animated version of Mulan, which is the only version worth seeing, um, you know that the Huns attacked China. The Sung Nu on several occasions attacked China. But China in one of its better moments in ancient history, knocked the Sung Nu out of China so hard that the Sung Nu come all the way across Asia, from China, across the steppes of Central Asia, what is now Siberia, across the Ural Mountains into Russia, and towards the areas to the north of the Black Sea. So here come the Huns. Now, if you thought the Goths made an impression on the German barbarians pushed up against Rome, the Huns are completely from another planet, or so it seems to these Europeans. They're not big, tall, muscular Viking proto-Viking men like the, like the Goths. They are little bandy-legged men, slant-eyed, yellowed skin. They are deeply Central Asian. They are like nothing the Europeans have seen in a very long time. And they're bandy-legged, which is sort of like this, because they learn to ride before they learn to walk. Like many people of Central Asia, the Huns are people of the horse. And so what they learn to do is they learn to ride and fight. And the Huns pass an invention on to the Goths, who eventually pass the invention on to the Romans. What invention could make horses a much more useful conveyor and weapon in war? What is it that Romans and before that Greeks have lacked so far? Isn't that kind of like horses that you put on your foot? Yeah, they're called stirrups. Without stirrups, <clears throat> as you ride, you're gripping the horse with your legs. Maybe you're, you have a saddle that you can hold on to, too. When you're shooting a bow, that's not too bad. But when you try to hit somebody while riding a horse, the laws of Newtonian physics say with every action comes an equal and opposite reaction. You may go swing or stab with a spear, and if you don't know what you're doing, you're just as likely to get knocked off your horse as you are to wound the enemy. But with stirrups, you can stand up in your stirrups. Your stirrups are attached to the saddle, which is attached to the horse. With stirrups, you can stand up and strike, or spear, or lance. And you are anchored to your horse. And if you know what you're doing, you can actually add the horse's momentum and your own body's momentum by standing just in the right way at the right time to your attack on a foot soldier. 
With stirrups, horse soldiers get the ascendancy, and for the next thousand years, cavalry, horse soldiers, are the queen of battle. They are the best unit to have. So the Huns bring these stirrups, of, indirectly, to Europe, through the, because the Goths see them and the Goths copy them. But the Huns are many. They are huge numbers of people. And they don't come and they, they, they swarm in like buffalo. Angry, violent, dangerous, predatory buffalo. They are huge in numbers. So the Goths and the Germans are terrified at what these Huns can do. They fight the Huns, and they lose to the Huns, and sometimes they're slain en masse, and sometimes they're enslaved en masse, and sometimes the Huns allow them to retreat, but the word gets out. So, the Goths, hello, gravity, and start, let us in, let us in. They start banging on the doors. Uh, they start beating at the gates. They start begging at the borders of the Roman Empire. Let us in. Well, the Eastern Roman Emperor, Valens, Valens, V-A-L-E-N-S, he decides that it would be a good idea to let them in. So the Goths are let in, and they are set up in the area northwest of Constantinople, what had been Thrace. They're set up there temporarily, you know, what's like a refugee camp. Men, women, and children. Now, this is Rome's first experience with this word, and it's a word you need to know. I'll spell it for you. You should write it down. V-O-L-K-S-W-A-N-D-E-R-U-N-G. I'll say it again. V-O-L-K-S. That's folks. W-A-N-D-E-R-U-N-G. That's Vandro. It's a German word for the wandering of an entire people. Volkswandro. V-O-L-K-S. W-A-N-D-E-R-U-N-G. Volkswandro. Volkswandro is not a raid, which is a small group looking for loot and booty of various kinds. A Volkswandro is not an invasion army. An invasion army is a lot like an arm being shot out of a body to reach out, grab, take, and beat on. A Volkswanderung is the movement of an entire people. Everyone. Their flocks, their animals, their slaves, their treasure, their homes, their women, their men, their aged. Everyone is on the march. The entire people is on the march. Yes? Is that similar or like the same as like the Israelites? Yeah, exactly. Except the Israelites, uh, yeah, well, if you are a Canaanite, suddenly you've got this folks wandering into your land when uh, the Israelites come out of the wilderness and uh, take the land of Canaan. Excellent. But now these folks wandering are not one relatively small people. They are masses of Germans and Goths. So the Goths are led into the Roman Empire by Valens. Valens needs farmers. Valens needs warriors. The Eastern Empire doesn't have enough people to get the job done. So he invites them in. But then he sends out a bunch of bureaucrats, paper pushers. And these bureaucrats think that these are barbarian scum. So the bureaucrats come out and they start telling the Goths how it's going to be. You're not free anymore. You're under the emperor. You don't have your own lives anymore. You're under the empire. All of the rules and regulations that our people have to follow, you now have to follow. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do the other thing because you're in Roman territory now. My rules or you leave. My way or the highway. The thing about the Goths, the thing you really need to really understand about the Goths is, uh, hmm, they're warrior men. Their women fight. Their children learn to fight. Everyone fights. Even the old can get ornery and fight. 
And they don't take kindly to a pencil neck geek or a bunch of them telling them how to live their lives. The bureaucrats that the emperor sends are so obnoxious that the gods kill them and say, fine, you want to treat us like slaves? Come, try to enslave us. Da, 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 da. The emperor come, comes out. He leads an army from Constantinople to Adrianople. Adrianople is right here. It's a day or two's march away from Constantinople. And the emperor and his army meet the Goths in battle, and for the first time they encounter horse cavalry with stirrups. Valens is killed. The Eastern Empire's army is destroyed. The Goths march on Constantinople, but can't break through the walls. So they just go on a rampage. Did this need to happen? What it would have taken is the Romans understanding something. That they need the Goths at least as much as the Goths need them. Instead, they try to treat, to treat the Goths like a bunch of idiots. There's one hair that's sticking up right into my field of vision. It's driving me nuts. So in 378, the Goths defeat the Romans at Adrianople and demonstrate the superiority of Gothic arms. Now, the Eastern Empire is afraid, and the Western Empire is also a bit afraid. After this, the Goths, the Eastern Goths, or the Ostrogoths, the Western Goths, or the Goths, or the Visigoths, the Vandals, not from Moscow, and the Franks, which means free men, uh, all cozy up to Rome's border. And many of them want to come across. Well, let's be clear about the terms before we cross. If we cross, we're crossing into farmland. Your people don't farm because there aren't enough Romans to fill the empire anymore. Plague after plague and the low birth rate of the dominate all combine to make this a hollowed out empty shell. So if you want us to come into your empire and give you some of our mojo, some of our strength, you're going to have to accept us as we are. Our kings and chieftains will be under your emperor. Any orders that the emperor has or any requests that he has will be given through our own chiefs. Don't send bureaucrats. Don't even think about it. Our kings may have us fight for you because it'll be our lands too. But don't expect us to wear your sissy girly Roman uniforms. We're going to fight in our own clothes, with our own weapons, in our own manly Germanic Gothic way. And if you don't like it, maybe we'll fight you. We're coming in as partners. You can accept that. The word the, in Latin is federates. F-O-E-D-E-R-A-T-E-S. Out of vocabulary. Just one you should know. Federates. We are going to be your confederates. We are going to be people who are allied with you. But they, we are not slaves. We are not to be treated like slaves. We are not going to be treated like your slavish sissy citizens. We are free men under our kings. And we fight for that freedom, and we may fight with you. But we're not yours. We don't belong to you. Bless you. So what happens is, they're both, both Roman empires in Rome and in the West and in Constantinople in the East accept these terms. And so in the early 400s, large numbers of unacculturated, unromanized body babblers enter the Roman Empire as allies of Rome. And they are given lands, lots of lands, near the borders in order so that these can act as armor for the empire, defending parts of it. But Rome is not going to be able to tax them, nor is Constantinople. Or are they going to be able to regulate them? Here's a secret. Those Roman farmers that are in the lands given to the barbarians who stay actually express relief. The taxes are lower. The regulations are less. It's actually easier to live under these barbarians than it is to live under the Roman government of the dominate. Because the incredible price of the military does not have to be exacted. The Goths... They don't need to pay for a military. They are a military. 
So these tribes end up settling throughout Europe, but there are uh, throughout the empire. But there are also other tribesmen who are still outside the empire. Well, in 410, the Visigoths arrive at Rome. This is a group of Visigoths from outside the empire. They have uh, an opportunity, I think, in 406 to cross the Rhine River in the middle of winter when the Rhine freezes. The Rhine does not freeze in modern times. It's a sign that global climate is unstable because, in fact, you have a frozen Rhine in 406 or 408, whenever they cross. For the next while, this raiding group of Visigoths goes around the Roman Empire. Eventually, they get to the city of Rome itself. When they do, is the emperor there to defend Rome? Hell no. The emperor Honorius and his sister Honoria, who shares rule with him, are hiding out in swamps near modern Venice, a place called Ravenna. <coughs> Visigoths break into Rome, and they put it to the sack. That means they loot it, they rape it. However, the Visigoths are very careful. If you can criminalize, criminally victimize somebody with respect, the Visigoths pull this off. When they sack Rome, they're respectful about it. They, they come in and they ask the Romans to gather up the booty and they give it. And If they do, there's no problem. They're not vicious about it. But still, for the first time in... Mm, oh gosh, I'm trying to think. Close to a thousand years. Close, for the first time in at least 700 years, 600, 700 years, there's a foreign army in Rome, inside Rome, inside Aurelius's walls, the Aurelian war, walls. This is bad. This is not a good sign. So Rome has been sacked. However, the Roman government survives. The Visigoths go away for a while. There is a Gothic chieftain that becomes the great general of the Western Roman Empire. His name is Stilicho. And Stilicho runs the Roman army like a Gothic army. He knows how to use natural-born Roman troops and natural-born Gothic troops side by side. He's very good at this. And he defeats his un-Romanized barbarian neighbors. Stilicho beats invading Gothic forces. Stilicho is going to make the Western Empire a bit strong for a while in the early, in the 14s and 420s. The Eastern Empire also is largely stable, but it's stable by paying off, paying off the barbarians. Now we come to the mid 400s AD. The Huns, which had been settled uh, north of the Black Sea, move into what we now know as Hungary, named after the Huns. In Hungary, in the heart of Europe outside of the Roman Empire, the Goths, I'm sorry, the, the Huns, get the Goths and the Germans to be their subordinates. A new king named Athala becomes the king of the Huns. Attila has killed his brother Bleda to become king. Attila is a figure of fearsome legend. Attila is both brilliant, fearless, and vicious. But if you deal with him straight, maybe he won't kill you. Attila, king of the Huns, becomes the overlord of all the barbarians north of Rome. His empire stretches across the Rhine and Danube fronts. With this power, what is he going to do? Well, the Romans have had to deal with the Goths for about a generation before Attila becomes king. And a Roman negotiating team sends a group of kids to be raised in the Hunnic way as hostages to an agreement that the Romans make. These hostages include a boy named Aetius, who's about Attila's age. And Aetius, living among the Huns, and Attila become friends. Aetius becomes the general of the Western Roman Empire. 
at the same time that Attila becomes the overlord of all the barbarians. Attila threatens Eastern Empire. Eastern Empire gives them money. You're going to love this. Not just to go away from the Eastern Empire. Not just to leave Constantinople alone. Eastern Empire pays the Huns to attack the Western Empire. Good job, Eastern Empire, sticking that dagger in your brother's back. Why do they do it? Because they know the Huns want to attack. They wouldn't have unified this massive barbarian horde if they weren't going to attack. So they're going to attack someone. The Eastern Empire pays them to attack the Western Empire and hopes to high heaven that uh, the Huns will spend themselves and satiate themselves in the West and will not come after Eastern Empire. So Attila and his massive barbarian horde crosses the Rhine. And in a place in Belgium, what's today Belgium, near a key burning, turning point battle in World War II, a place called Bastogne, the Romans, the Goths, and the Huns, and their Goths, all come into conflict at a place called Shalom. At Shalom, in 451, also known as the Catalinian Fields, the Romans and the Goths fight the Huns. Amazingly, Aetius is able to defeat Attila. Amazingly. So the Huns retreat for now. Rome is triumphant. They are jubilant. Honorius imprisons Aetius because he doesn't think he's needed anymore. The emperor... I don't think, actually, it's not Honorius, sorry. The emperor imprisons Aetius. Aetius has just saved Rome. He's also saved the barbarians. But um, er, uh, er, what if Aetius wants to be emperor now? So to prevent that, Aetius is uh, imprisoned, and he dies, like Jeffrey Epstein, by killing himself. No, he's killed. So now Rome doesn't have Aetius. And Attila hears about this. So the next year, Attila's army breaks into Gaul and goes south into Italy. Attila's army wants Rome. Is the emperor there? No! He's back in Ravenna, in the swamps near what is today Venice, hiding out. Instead, the guy in Rome running things is Pope Leo the Great, the leader of the Western Christian Church. Pope Leo is known to history as the secret Western Roman Emperor. Because at a time when the Western Roman Emperors were small, petty men, Leo, as the head of Christianity in the West, has great respect, great authority, and he's a very good leader. Strong-willed, but not stubborn, uh, wise, without being arrogant. The night before Attila's men are going to cross and attack Rome, Leo goes out to meet Attila with a group of priests. Now, we don't know what happened. Attila was an extremely super, superstitious fellow. And it's quite possible that Leo, resplendent as the leader of Western Christendom, overawed him and convinced him that Rome is God's chosen city. And if you attack Rome, God will smite you. Attila's not a Christian, but he appreciates that many gods have many powers. He's afraid of lightning, for example. So maybe Pope Leo did a, an intimidation. Not with men, but with God. Maybe Attila said, whoa, no, you can't fight God. And, and he turns around and leaves the next day. Or maybe Pope Leo brings out a lot of the gold in Rome and says, here, take this. You don't need to sack Rome. We give it to you as a gift. And Attila says, okay. Or maybe it was a little of both. For whatever reason, Pope Leo goes out and negotiates with Attila, and the next day the Huns leave, and so do the barbarians under their command. Attila chooses to leave Rome be, and Leo gets the credit, as he deserves. 
So the Huns go back, and Attila goes back to his capital in Hungary to celebrate and think about future attacks. After all, Constantinople has all that wealth, and they only they already paid us, so we can do whatever we want. And Rome paid us to leave, but that doesn't mean that we can't come back. However, there's a feast, a lot like Alexander's last night. And in this feast, Attila eats and he drinks. And then he goes uh, into the bedchamber with his red-haired wife, Ildiko. And uh, the saying is that he has offended Ildiko, that he calls her by the name of Attila's first wife, that he uh, treats her family members badly, uh, that Ildiko has a grudge on him. Here's a secret. If you share a bed with somebody, try not to let them have a grudge with you. Because if they don't care about killing, they could hurt you or kill you bad. Hurt you bad or kill you. Attila dies that night. Whether it was poison or being stabbed, doesn't really, he's dead. Ildiko gets blamed. But with Attila's death, his massive unity, uh, unified empire of barbarians falls apart. The great threat to Rome that is the Huns dissipates. Now, Attila had been called the Scourge of God. What a scourge is, is a very special type of whip. It's got a handle, and it's got a bunch of ends that have little hooks on them. When you whip somebody with a scourge, you literally are hitting their back with hooks, and then when you pull the whip back, chunks of flesh go with it. A scourge is a very, very, very nasty weapon to use on anyone. If you use it on a slave, you're basically uh, whipping him in a way that probably will kill him, or maybe will cripple him. So Attila was considered by the church to be the scourge of God, sent to punish us for our sins. But Attila's dead. Just after Attila dies, the Vandals come. Now... The Vandals had taken territory in Spain, but they left Spain and attacked North Africa. St. Augustine was a Christian saint in this region who wrote a famous book called Confessions and the City of God, a very important religious figure. Augustine is killed by the Vandals when they attack. So the Vandals take over the old Carthage region. But in 455, a couple years after Attila dies, the Vandals take their fleet, they have a fleet, they cross to Italy, and they pay Rome back for the Third Punic War. When the Vandals come into Rome, they're not respectful. They're not peaceful. They're not just there for the booty. They want to hurt Rome, humiliate Rome. Make sure that the world knows that the Romans are under the Vandals' sandaled heel. Why do the Vandals hate the Romans so much? Oddly enough, the Vandals are Christians when they do this. So are most of the German and Gothic tribes. They're Christians. Now, they're a different kind of Christian. There was a prophet named Arius who went out to the Germans during the crisis, just after the crisis. And Arius preached to the Germans Christianity. But Arius had been cast out of the regular church because he had some unusual beliefs about the nature of Christ. So when the Goths and Germans march into the Roman Empire, they're Christians, just like the Romans are. But the Romans are Catholic Christians. The Goths are Aryan Christians. They don't really get along. So, in some ways, the Vandals consider themselves the, the sword of the Aryan branch of Christianity here to punish those damn Catholics. But it goes deeper than that. By this point, Roman society is relatively tolerant, has been for a very long time, of homosexuality. The Vandals see this as perversion. And so, um, they view the Romans as fake, false, phony Christians because they abide and accept and tolerate what the Vandals consider to be perversion. So when the Vandals come to Rome, they come with a holy fury. They're barbarians, 
but they also have a grudge. They now control the land of Carthage, and they're avenging Carthage's destruction, and they see the Romans as a bunch of false Christian hypocritical perverts. So with all of this, when the Vandals come into Rome, they're not respectful. They burn, they rape, they steal, they destroy. They do things that make no sense, like break statues all over the place for the sheer love of destruction. The word vandal to this day means property and crime. Somebody doing something stupid and meaningless against somebody else's property. They have vandalized it. They have done to this property what the vandals once did to Rome. The Vandals leave Rome. It's sort of a broken city by this point. Now we come to the 470s. After a series of weak and ineffectual emperors in the West, a young mid-teenage uh, boy named Romulus Augustus is made emperor. Romulus Augustus is known to history as Romulus Augustulus. Augustulus meaning Little bitty Augustus, little bitty Augustus, you're so cute, little bitty Augustus, Romulus Augustulus. So Romulus Augustulus is named after the founder of the city of Rome and the founder of Rome's empire. Oh, what an auspicious name. However, Romulus Augustulus is an ineffectual, terrified team. The guy who really runs things from behind the scenes is a guy named Odoacker. And Odoacker is the king of the Ostrogoths. They basically run the show from behind the scenes, and they keep the uh, emperor around for window dressing. However, there comes a moment when Odoacker thinks this thought. Why do I need this pipsqueak anyway? I run my kingdom. We call it the Roman Empire. He's called the emperor, but he serves no function. So, Odoacker kills the boy, proclaims the end of the Roman Empire and the dawn of a new age. This is the Ostrogothic Kingdom of Italy, and that happens in the year of our Lord, 476. The Roman Empire falls. Now, the Dark Age that follows takes a couple of hundred years to fully set in, but it had also started before this. Rome was so weak in the face of these barbarians because um, civilization had begun to break down. There are two things you need to understand about why it matters that Rome fell in the 5th century, not the 3rd. Fell at the end of the Dominate, not during the crisis. First of all, Constantine helps make the emperor empire Christian. The Christian church is the only thing that survives the fall of Rome in the West. Without that church, preserving books, preserving civilization, limiting the depredations of the barbarians. The Dark Age probably would have been a lot longer, and civilization would have probably been a lot slower to recover. The second thing is also attributable to Constantine. By establishing a second Rome at Constantinople, Constantine allows the Eastern Roman Empire to have a new central basis. And when the empire in the West falls, the empire in the East is going to continue in one form or another for a thousand years. And that empire is right on the main route from the Islamic world that will be to the heart of Christendom. Had there been no Constantinople, no Eastern or uh, Roman or Byzantine Empire, the Muslims would have come straight into Europe, and it's likely that Christian Western civilization would have been murdered. Because there was a Constantinople, because there was an Eastern Roman or a Byzantine Empire, when the Islamic attack comes and it happens a much longer route through North Africa and Spain, and it's much weaker. So because of those additional centuries, the Roman world is Christianized, the Germans who conquer them and the Goths who conquer them are Christianized for the most part, and the Eastern Roman Empire is set on its basis. And all of those things, as you'll find next unit, are going to be important to the return of civilization in the end of the Dark Age. So now we come to it. Why did the Roman Empire fall? Por qué? Well, here's the list that I have. And there may be others. And I will invite you 
to help me fill these blanks in if you can. We start. The problem of imperial succession we've talked a lot about is not solved, ever. The closest it comes to being solved is Diocletian's Tetrarchy and the Romans abandon it as soon as Diocletian retires. So no Tetrarchy uh, and yeah, constant civil war, increasing civil war. And civil war is going to break Rome's armies and its economy during the crisis. And the dominate is going to see a revival of the economy and the society, but with a terrible, terrible set of regulations uh, that control wages, prices, the coinage, um, and that limit people's freedom so that they can't sell themselves into slavery uh, to avoid paying the tax man. To the point where when barbarians actually conquer, Romans find themselves surprisingly relieved if they get through the first bit of chaos. Intense specialization. Romanization is so successful that the formerly warlike peoples of the empire, the Gauls and the Celtiberians and the Carthaginians and the Syrians, and, well, to the extent Syrians are warlike, and the Britons, they're all turned from wolves into lap poodles. They become civilized. There's an old TV show from Christmas time called uh, Santa Claus is Coming to Town. It may have been something your parents made you watch. It has puppets. And in Santa Claus is Coming to Town, there's an evil winter warlock on a mountain that terrorizes everyone. But he finds love and his heart, and he becomes nice and good and useless at magic. But he's good and nice. He's lost his power, but he's gained his soul. It's a nice story, if you're a kid. The people who Rome fought and conquered have been turned into the winter warlock after he got his soul. And they're not warriors anymore. They are so specialized. They're farmers, they're ranchers, they're orchard keepers. They are uh, carpenters. They're peaceful civilians now. The civilian lifestyle behind the walls. And that means that when Dark Age threatens, they're not adaptable enough. And lots of people starve to death with the fall of Rome. Decadence. In the Roman Republic, women were for prevented from wearing jewelry in public because it was considered to be a distraction, a frippery, a sign of decadence. Women were not allowed to wear too much makeup in public either. Men were not allowed to live ostentatiously because in the Republic, you were defined by your dignitas, autoritus, gravitas, and pietas. You were defined by the virtues that you had, not the property in your possession. Well, that spirit of the Roman Republic died with Augustus. Actually, it probably died with Marius. And the Roman upper class, with a few uh, notable exceptions, is dedicated to pleasure, pleasure, and more pleasure. The reason, one of the reasons why homosexuality becomes so tolerant, uh, tolerated is because so many Roman leaders uh, dabble. And all of this pleasure-loving may not in and of itself be bad, but it might. If your life becomes nothing more than an endless quest to be happy and joyous and pleasured or pleased, uh, there's an emptiness to that pursuit eventually that you'll come to. You realize you cannot, you cannot make yourself happy just by trying. You've got to do worthwhile things that make you proud of yourself, and then you can be happy. If your goal is to try to skip all that hard work and just make yourself happy, you're, you're engaged in better living through chemistry, which is what leads to alcohol and drug abuse. Those chemicals won't make you happier. They'll just make you feel artificially differently. The Romans engage in all of their pleasurable pursuits, but in the end, without good hard work, without achievements, without living a life that they can be proud of, it weakens their willpower. It weakens their ability to carry the burdens of citizenship. In the dominate, there's the high taxes and regulation. That even if you are a hard worker, your, <clears throat> your wealth is going to be stolen from you by the government to pay for more walls and more troops. And if you want to change your life, you can't. You're stuck in the job your daddy did. 
you can't sell yourself into slavery even anymore. Not that that was a great solution. How bad do taxes and regulation have to be that people will sell themselves into slavery? It got that bad during the Dominate. The lead soldering in the pipes we've talked about. Lead poisoning. Generations and generations of lead poisoning. All those wonderful Roman waterworks, the aqueducts, the baths, the fountains, the clean water, the toilets, all of that stuff, which kept Roman cities clean and Roman people clean, all of it came at the terrible, terrible price of protracted lead poisoning over two, three, four, or even 500 years. And lead poisoning leads to mental weakness, emotional weakness, and physical weakness. It leads to idiocy and stupidity, mental illness, and physical decrepitude. It attacks the central nervous system. So the Romans not only are living under an oppressive government that makes them less likely to work hard and have a lot of kids, but they're also poisoning themselves, as their ancestors and their ancestors' ancestors did. From the time of Lucius Verus invading the east, when Marcus Aurelius was in the north, bringing back the plague from Parthia, Romans have experienced wave after wave after wave of epidemic plague. Even if the birth rate was higher, every few decades there is a culling. There is a death of lots and lots of people due to disease. So the Roman Empire is not reproducing its numbers, and the people who are there are being hit by plague, as well as high taxes and high regulation. The Romans, because of this population problem, need barbarian troops. Also, because the fighting spirit of most Romans has been quenched, they need guys who have the eye of the tiger, the thrill of the fight, to take a, uh, some lines from the song from the movie Rocky III. These guys want to fight. They like to fight. Fighting is fun. Fighting is good. Why? Because we're strong. they weak. We beat on them and have some fun at their expense. And then we take their women and take their stuff. And, ah, good to be strong. Well, <sighs> having tough guys like these <clears throat> is kind of obnoxious, but it also means that you're not going to be easily conquered. And with the arrival of the Volkswanderung, the wandering of entire nations of people, barbarian settlers also establish themselves in the empire, but they're not going to be Romanized. They refuse to be Romanized. So you've got foreign populations inside your country. That would be like people coming to the United States and refusing to learn English, and refusing to send their kids to public schools, and refusing to learn our laws, our ways, our customs, living like a people apart in our midst. That would not work. That is not the melting pot. That is not the America that is an immigrant nation. What that is is a recipe for the destruction of America. You've got a bunch of hostile communities living like they did in the old country. Well, they're not in the old country anymore. They're in America. These barbarians are not in the old country anymore. They're in Rome. But they still live under their chieftains with their customs and their rules with no reference to Rome. This is also a big deal. Because if Romans are no longer culturally unified, what are they? They're not a racial group. The only thing that unifies them is their culture. And with this Volkswander and these barbarian troops, these barbarian settlers, that's all gone. The spirit of the Republic, of the fighting man, of conscript fathers, of citizen soldiers, that's long dead. Fighting is for other people. You hire them to. And finally, there is just old age. Rome's been around for about 1,200 years by this point, the city of Rome. The empire has been around for 500 years. 500 years ago, um, let's see, Magellan was still <clears throat> sailing around the world for the first time, first human to ever sail around the world. 500 years ago, Cortez had just kind of conquered Mexico. 500 years ago, people knew the world was round, but they knew the earth and sun revolved around it. 500 years ago, Catholics and Protestants were just beginning to fight one another. The average life expectancy was like 25 years old. Being old has its advantages, but it also has some disadvantages. There's a lower energy. There is a lower spirit because there's less hope. A young person, you've got your whole lives ahead of you. Somebody my age, if I thought about it in the wrong way, would start feeling resentful because I don't have as many years ahead of me as I do behind me. And even if I did, I'd live most of them in a decrepit old body. 
The Romans are old. Their empire is old. Their society is old. The spirit that gave them energy, that had them conquer the world, is long gone. Now they're just trying to hold on. That's not the same thing. They're not trying to fight for a better world. They're just trying to hold on to what they've got. And what they've got isn't that good because of the taxes and regulation. Also, Romans are so peaceful. And were given in decline and fall of the Roman Empire blames Christianity for this. He says that Christianity stole the fighting spirit from Rome's male population. And he might, I don't think he's right, but I think that he has a point. It's partially true. But I think just being civilized for so long. Look, I spent some years growing up in the Bronx. In the Bronx, everyone fights. You have to. Or you get eaten. It's what happens when you grow up in a certain type of poor neighborhood. If you grow up in a nice suburban environment, you may reach adulthood without ever having to defend yourself. Therefore, you're going to be less willing to go and get yourself into a fight. Fighting can hurt, but it's not as bad as your fear of fighting. I'll say that again. Fighting can hurt, but it's not as bad as your fear of fighting. The courage necessary to take a weapon and defend your freedom isn't there for the Romans the way it used to be. And also, more and more, those Romans that are thoughtful are detached from reality, living in fantasy worlds, imagining what utopia would be like. Utopia, the word utopia, literally means nowhere. Utopia is an imaginary perfect world that we can't live in because we're not people. Um, we're not perfect. We're not imaginary. We are people, flawed people. About the best we can hope for is freedom. But a lot of the best Roman minds were still were just detaching from the world. They weren't thinking about the practical problems. They weren't thinking about how to deal with the barbarians. They were imagining what the city of God would be like. Glorious book. Glorious religious thoughts. But it wasn't going to help protect the empire from conquest. So Rome finally falls. Questions, comments, thoughts? Yes. I kind of feel like they lost their sense of direction as well because they didn't really have any wars or places they wanted to conquer as they had it all. And then they also lost the sense of something certain in the future, like a sense of Christianity helped it, but they didn't really have a set Christianity or a set regulation of ways that they thought. Yeah. Because they kind of lost their old gods, they gained a new god. But the new god wasn't going to tell them to build the empire. Right. Christianity takes people's attention off this world and onto the next. And that's what Gibbon, one of the things Gibbon blamed it for. The Romans no longer had a dream that unified. At one point they did. It was to unify the world, make it civilized. Make an empire of mankind. Not anymore. That dream died. You're right. Without that unifying vision, there was nothing to hold them together. Tomorrow, I plan to give you the exam. Thursday, I plan to make it a work day where you get work back and make corrections on tests and quizzes, but I am not accepting anything after 3 p.m. on Thursday. So make sure that you get everything that you want in on Thursday and that you use the day on Thursday to do your last bit of work for the third quarter. Thank you. Come again.